My name is Saj or Sajnika and Surya Narayanan if you want to call me that. Um, yeah, so today I'll be talking about uh, Python for black box testers. Um, one of the most uh, frequently asked questions when I put a slide like this is, uh, how long is my name? And uh, the quick answer to that is, that's 26 characters, if you didn't see that. Okay, so uh, this is some information about me. I am a coastal geoscientist. Don't ask me why I did that or what I do there. So that is what I studied. I'm also a civil engineering graduate and um, I joined um, software engineering or IT as we um, call it uh, by sheer accident more than interest. Um, I right now have 10 plus years of experience in software quality assurance. I am also um, HP certified in uh, quality center and quali quick test professional. I currently lead quality assurance at Vistaprint. I am a proud contributor to Holmium Core. I'll let you know what that is about towards the end of this presentation. And uh, for more information, you can check out my website. Um, honestly speaking, this is just a, a picture of me when you go to that website with links to other social networking sites. You don't get much information except my Facebook URL and all that things. Right, so that is some basic information about me. Um, before I begin, a quick show of hands. How many of us are software testers in this group? Awesome. Okay, how many of us are black box testers in this group? None, okay. Um, how many of us are developers here? Awesome, eh? Okay, so the takeaway after this presentation is Developers, be nice to black box software testers. We are having such a difficult time in understanding how things are working. So um, this is more like my experience when I started. Uh, right, so when I, when I got my first software engineering job, what I thought uh, black box testing, yeah, before that. Uh, this is a quick content of what is uh, gonna be in this presentation, I'll be giving you a background. I'll be talking about manual versus automated testing, why I chose Python or rather why Python chose me. I'll be talking about Selenium and other um, use cases uh, where I use Python. And I'm gonna talk about some of the lessons learned. These may be uh, computer science 101, but uh, again, not for me. I'm a coastal geoscientist, right? So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna be talking about black box testing. So who exactly is a black box tester? When I got my first job, I thought uh, the job was gonna be something like this, where I would be the guy in the green shirt and uh, it would all be very exciting, rosy, and uh, things are gonna be fantastic for me and I've made it into the IT world. However, it ended up being something like this. I'm sure we can all agree with this, um, especially when we have uh, a production release that is coming and things have to be tested. You have a long queue of items that have been developed waiting to be tested. And uh, most of the times the pressure is all on the QA guy because he's the la he or she is the last line of defense before getting, getting code out to production. So this was my typical day when I thought it would be like this. And uh, these were some of the things I had to do or I continue doing. So a uh, black box tester is someone who does not worry about how the application is coded. So I don't look into the innards of the application. I'm more worried about whether if it works as expected. So I look at it from a, from a user perspective. If I give a certain input, do I get this output? And I come up with uh, test plans or test scenarios. I test the application or I get the application tested. And um, my job primarily works, uh, is working with uh, defect tracking system, finding and reporting issues, retesting issues. And um, we also do a lot of regression testing. Quick show of hands, how many of us know what regression testing and retesting is? Right, so um, having said that, one of, uh, if I were to ask you to define a black box tester with one word, how would you do that, Luther? Patient. Patient. Anything else? Perseverance. Perseverance. Anything else? Uh, ignorant. Ignorant. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, man. Anything else? Crusher. Say what again? Crusher. Someone that tried to crush. Oh yeah, crush your ego, perhaps. Crush a developer's ego. Anything else? Overcritical. Overcritical. Come on, hit me. Anything else? <laughs> Attention to details. Come on, you guys are not, you're being very nice to me. And 
in my 10 years of experience, no one has been this nice. Come on, hit me with your worst. Logical. Logical. All right, I like this guy, eh? <laughs> Anything else? One more. It's Frustrated? Really, really difficult to make them understand what the software is. Exactly. Really difficult to make them understand. So these are some of the things which I've been told. So destructive, yeah, we have that here. Hurt ego, yeah, sometimes when I file a defect, it's like, dude, are you crazy? This work says design, this is not a defect. And I'm like, nah, -uh, no way, this is a defect and your code sucks. I cannot say that here in a developer's forum, but eventually I end up uh, hurting some people's ego. I've been called a nitpicker, I've been called attentive, some of the positive ones here perfectionist, obsessive, compulsive, and things like that. So these are some of the things which uh, people have told me. Um, I take that as a compliment and I think this is what a person should be doing when he or she is doing quality assurance. I mean, we are the last line of defense between the, the developers and the users. Having said that, what exactly is the problem here? Someone said it is very difficult to make these guys understand. I'm going to say these guys. All right, so this is uh, our current product. It's called Vista Mobi. I'm from Vista Print. Over here, you can see a simple login screen, right? You can see that uh, we have a product name here. We have login, we have Facebook, and we have uh, the username login with a password. If you scroll down, you will also see uh, links to forgot password or, or register a new user. So if I were to ask you to give me the number of test cases you see here, what would your figure be? You, sir, in the white shirt. Yeah. 15. 15. OK. Wow, that's an ambitious person there. Anything else? Infinite. Oh, fantastic. I'm going to be a very conservative test engineer, right? So I think I'm going to have five test cases. Again, I'm going to be very conservative. Test cases like whether I can log in with Facebook, whether I can log in with a valid username password, whether I can uh, make sure I can uh, recover my password if I've forgotten, and so on. So I'm, I'll put five test cases, right? I'm going to be conservative. And uh, I have to test this on uh, at least three browsers these days. So it's Firefox, Chrome, and sometimes we partner with uh, browsers like Opera. So I'm going to be very conservative and I'm going to say I'm not including IE here, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I've got three browsers to test. And uh, Vista Mobi supports three regions. We have international, we have India, and we have uh, Indonesia. So I'm putting that here. and. Uh, I have two languages. We support Bahasa, uh, Indonesia, and we support English. And I have uh, two environments. We have our developer environment, and we have the staging environment. So the person who said uh, 10 cases and uh, infinite cases, I like the way you think, um, a very conservative estimate for a person like me is 180 test cases. Now, if, if I take about one minute to test this uh, one test case. So that's about 180 minutes, which uh, I have to spend doing just login testing instead of doing other things I like. So the time taken to test my whole application would be, yeah, you don't want to be in my shoes when you're doing it manually. Okay, so we've defined the problem and uh, we say regression testing could be boring. Uh, one of the things, um, Again, I'm going to come back to you. You said it's very difficult to make these people understand. That is primarily because uh, we don't speak a common language. So earlier in my first company, I file a bug report or I have a test case suite. It's all in English. However, English is open to interpretation. So if I say, I did this, login does not work, you may look at it and look, what the hell is he talking about? This, this can be uh, interpreted in so many ways. While I might think login does not work, you might think I'm not doing it the right way. So we did not have a common language, even though it was all in English. We, I mean, our, our understanding to what was written down was completely different. And um, one of the other things was, um, if you have a huge application and you keep adding on features over and over that, your regression test case suite ends up getting bigger and bigger. So a typical sprint in my company is like uh, in two, two weeks. Now, I have a five features and I, I have uh, 200 test cases in my regression test case suite. Three months later, I have uh, 50 features and my regression test case now is um, 500. However, my sprint time is still two weeks. Now, what do I do? 
that is not possible. So I end up uh, not covering so many things and uh, my test suite keeps growing and growing. Testing becomes a bottleneck. Eventually when things leak to production, if we have a bug in production, the first question anyone asks is, why is this not tested? So the QA guy or the girl ends up taking the bullet for it and he's like, okay, he, has to, he or she has to cut a sorry figure and I'm like, okay, we try to do it better, but it cannot be done. That is the honest truth because your, your suite keeps growing, your time is fixed here. And uh, I'm gonna point you to something here. Uh, this, how many of us know about the infinite monkey theorem? Show of hands. Infinite monkey theorem, okay, the gist of it is um, if you put a monkey and uh, give it infinite time um, in front of a typewriter, there's a good chance it might come up with uh, one of Shakespeare's plays, right? So the key concept here is having a lot of time. We don't have that. Your sprint time is defined and your suite keeps growing and growing. So the obvious answer to this is, aha. Uh -huh. Automated testing, but some of us thought adding more people would solve the problem. That clearly added more to the, uh, added the problem. Okay, so automated testing is uh, the more efficient answer. Um, this was something I, I learned when Martin Fowler was in Singapore two years back. I had not heard this before. This apparently is Computer Science 101. Again, I'm not a computer scientist. So you fail fast, you fail often, and you can do that with automated testing quite easily. Uh, there's one more thing I wanna add here. It's called fail cheaply. So there's no point if you fail fast and fail often in production. It is gonna cost you a lot of money to get that bug fixed in production. So you try to fail cheaply, as cheaply as possible. You can do automated testing for integration, functional performance. Auto automation testing is the building block for continuous integration or deployment. It is every development team's dream to get it continually deployed. You ask any web guy here, the biggest problem is a lot of processes in between his or her code getting out to production. So if he or she can do a one button push to production, that would be fantastic for any team, especially a web team. And for a huge application, uh, the return on investment is very high, so some people might argue that uh, it takes a very long time to, to come up with automated test suites, but again, if your life cycle is long enough, that warrants this investment so that your returns are much higher towards uh, yeah, your application's life cycle. Okay, you might remember I said uh, I'm, uh, I'm certified in uh, HP's QTP QC, so my obvious answer was QTP. I'm familiar with that, it's popular. Everyone in my uh, previous jobs used that. And uh, for a noob like me, it supported record and play. Record and play is where I can turn the tool on, click on record, do my stuff on the application. QTP will record everything, spit out a nice code that I can work with, and I can rerun this code over and over. So I, I, that is essentially my automated test case. It was fantastic for a person like me. However, what was the problem? It is expensive. It is very expensive. And it is uh, proprietary. Uh, QTP, the last time I worked with, was very Windows-centric. And uh, the recent apps that I have been working on, although they were all browser apps, it did not warrant the money that uh, we would be spending on QTP. So we, I was kind of forced to look at other solutions and not QTP. And, um, some people say that QTP is not the most cool technology or cool automated testing tool that we have in the market today. And uh, this guy seems to be agree, uh, agreeing with that. He says QTP has to die and he gives you a lot of reasons as to why QTP should die. You can check out his blog there. And uh, yeah, so I thought I had QTP, now I did not. What exactly is the alternative? Python over here. I, 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 um, in my previous company, there was this guy called Ali. He is my Python mentor. And this guy walks, about, walks, walks to the office and uh, he sees me doing all these things manually, trying QTP with a trial version, setting up in my VMware. We used Mac and he's like, oh man, what the hell are you doing? Why don't you try Python Selenium? And I'm like, I am not a programmer and Python, it's something I cannot do. And he went on the usual stuff about saying, it is very easy to set up. It is readable code, yada, yada. And I'm like, dude, you are a computer engineer. I am not, it is not possible for me. 
However, he pushed me to install Python. I think um, Mac comes with uh, Python uh, by default. He pushed me to install Selenium, and uh, he told me to run this code here. I'm not sure if it's big enough for everyone to see. So over here, it says, from Selenium import web driver. At that time, I was like, yeah, whatever. OK, fine, I put that here. And then I typed. I typed in Firefox equals webdriver.firefox. I hit enter and voila, the browser opened. I did not have to do anything except install Selenium on my Mac. Nothing else. No licenses, no uh, complicated code or anything. And with that browser, I was able to go to Google and uh, I was able to look for this element and I was able to send a hello world text. This blew me away. I mean, I've seen this in QTB, but that involved a lot of setup. But with four lines of code, I was able to do exactly what I was doing earlier much cheaply. So this was my first introduction to Python. It is Python Selenium nevertheless, but it is Python for me. OK, so we get back to the problem here. Remember, we had uh, 180 test cases, which takes a lot of time for me to test. Um, now, I put the same thing in a nice Python script. This code does not work. It is just for demo, OK? <laughs> right, so I have my browsers here. You can see that uh, I've put all my three browsers here. I've put all my countries here. International, Indonesia, India, languages, environments, and my test cases. And I have to run this once. And within these loops, each of my 180 test cases would get executed. And this was like, holy crap, what have I been doing all along instead of do writing Python Selenium code. And the time to test such a screen. Yeah, I can do very many other things instead of manually pushing buttons and doing monkey testing. OK, uh, what does Selenium offer me? Um, of course, with Firefox, it came with a plugin called uh, Selenium IDE, where I could do record and play. Um, it worked well for a noob like me. It supported multiple browsers, including IE, Opera, and also PhantomJS. Um, it supported mobile, so I could uh, get Selenium installed remotely on Android or, or iPhone. I could run my exact same tests on these devices, apart from my desktop browsers. And uh, it's, it offered very many ways to locate my elements. I could do it via ID, XPath, CSS selector. These things, I had no clue about what it was. It was quite easy for me to figure out. And I could do other things apart from taking screenshots. And if there's something that uh, you think is important enough to go here, let me know. That's why I have these uh, ellipses here. And uh, apart from Selenium, what else did I use Python for? So at my previous company, we sometimes had uh, web APIs. Um, there was this, uh, this feature called USSD. Any of us aware of what USSD is? Don't ask me what it stands for. I'm not going to tell you. Google it. Or rather, um, so this is where I was able to uh, register a user on our service via SMS. And this did not, uh, or I could, uh, I could uh, buy credits via SMS and things like that. So there is no UI for this. It is all APIs. So for a guy like me, without any programming experience, you would have seen uh, your black box testers in your teams having spreadsheets open or notepads open with the all curl commands uh, pasted there. So that is exactly what I was doing. So I had uh, three APIs um, to um, test at the beginning. Now, it was easy for me to do it manually. But when three became 30, yeah, that, that uh, made my life quite difficult. And I could uh, easily automate that using funk load. And uh, that is where Python helped me. Apart from that, you remember we spoke about developers and QA engineers not having a common language. So instead of a bug report written in English, I can attach a Python script to the bug report. And the developer would be able to say whether the script is OK or whether the code is OK. With that, we have a common language. And there is no room for interpretation or doubts or anything. So, uh, so uh, communication became clearer. And um, creating test data, um, there's this guy called Adam Goucher that uh, I frequently um, came across when I was learning Python. So he, he said, uh, Creating test data is best left to computers. Humans are more, more, um, far better in thinking of scenarios rather than wasting time in creating test data. For instance, um, you take a username field and the 
typical test engineer would put his or her name first as one of the test cases and then he or she would probably put his boyfriend's name or girlfriend's name or whatever some random characters so this could easily be automated by a simple script that spits out random strings every time and this is one of the things you can do so you leave the machine to take care of creating data for you you think of scenarios and um, apart from that you can write test suites in uh, Selenium Python. Finally, we could uh, use the same suites, hook it up with funk load, and use that for performance testing. So there are very many things uh, that uh, we could do with Python. And again, if you think something needs to go here, let me know. I'll be happy to put it. OK, so we spoke about my journey as a, a manual test engineer, my problems my um, experiences with QTP and finally Python or rather why Python chose me. What are my lessons learned? This might be again computer science 101 to you guys but uh, not for me. So keep things like the basics like keep your concerns separate. Who knew? I did not know that. So I'm going to be telling you some of the things uh, which I learned over the course of my time. So again this is a simple script. Over here you can see I'm importing WebDriver and I have three browsers, Firefox, Chrome, and PhantomJS. PhantomJS is a headless browser. And uh, I have a simple for loop where I'm uh, using these three browsers. And I'm going to VistaMobi's login page. And I'm sending username into the username field. And I'm um, sending the password to the password field. And I'm clicking on validate login button. This is a simple working script for Vista Mobi, which works for all three browsers. Now, our web guys are fantastic. And uh, typically, non-Python uh, developers have to have coding standards. And uh, some, one day, the web guys decided to change the IDs from underscore to hyphen. Now, assume I'm using this same piece of code in 50 test cases where I'm trying to log in and do stuff. Now, if this person changes three elements, uh, the locators of three elements from underscore to hyphen, I have to change this in 150 places, which was a huge pain. And that is not a very smart way of doing it. So, <coughs> again, what Adam Goucher suggested was you don't put your elements within your tests, you use something called page objects. So page objects, you have it ripped out from your test. You don't identify your elements within your test. You pull that separately, and you have a page object. In your page object, you work with the elements that you want to work with. Don't start defining everything here. So over here, I have the elements that I'm working with. I've defined it here. And what should a page object do? It should, uh, the login page object essentially should log in for me. It should not do anything else. The registration page object should register for me. My tests should only be driving through these, should not be working on setting these up. So here I have my login page object with my elements defined. I have a nice method here. And uh, my test, which was like that earlier, would now look like this. You can see that uh, I'm instantiating the login page and I'm also going to the URL. And <coughs> I'm doing an email login. I'm passing in the username and password. And uh, I'm getting the dashboard page object here. And I'm just asserting whether the button is displayed. If it is displayed, then it means I've logged in successfully. This is all your test should be doing. You should not be worrying about defining everything under your test. Your test should only be getting to the assert statement as soon as possible. Again, if you want more information, OK, there should be a URL about uh, Adam Goucher's example of page objects. So Google this guy. There's a fantastic scre sc screencast from him about how to use page objects efficiently. And uh, I would very much uh, recommend that. Coming to my second lesson, what do you see here? Um, I saw another person use sleep within their, their code earlier. And uh, for Vista Movie, we use a lot of JavaScript which means the app works very fast. And <coughs> my method here works faster than that. So sometimes what it tries to do is I go to the URL. And before the element appears, 
my, I start working with it and my tests end up failing invariably. So the easiest and the cheapest way is to import, sleep, uh, import time and do a sleep for five seconds. However, there is a problem here. Can anyone tell me what problem it could have? Scalability. Okay. Fantastic. Scalability. Um, well, I'm going to go a little more basic than that for me. If, if page load times more. Page load times are more. Yeah. So if it takes beyond five seconds, my test is going to fail. If it takes only one second, I still have to wait for four seconds before I can continue with my test. So this was a pain. And if you ask any automated test engineer today, sleeping is one of the worst ways of uh, doing test automated testing. Uh, within your application. So the alternative is you start using weights. So Selenium fortunately offered uh, this by default. So I could uh, use implicit weights. Selenium also offered explicit weights where I could say do this but wait until some condition happens. So I could be more explicit in whatever I wanted to wait for before continuing with my test. So I do away with my importing of time. I throw in an implicit weight and I continue with my life and uh, things are back to normal. If it is uh, within five seconds, I continue. If it is beyond 20 seconds, then there is something wrong with my application when it takes more than 20 seconds for me to log in. So that's my max time out there. So the lesson learned here is use weights instead of sleep. Say that again. OK, so with sleep, let's say I sleep for five seconds. Until, and uh, after five seconds, I expect my username element to show up. Let's say the username element shows up within one second. I still am wasting time, four seconds, to uh, continue with my test. Let's say the element shows up after six seconds instead of five. Then my test obviously failed when I wanted it to pass. So having a dynamic uh, thing like wait would uh, give me this advantage. So wait will be triggered on uh, wait. How do you define the trigger? Will it pass on to next line uh, when the <coughs> element appears? Correct. So by default, Selenium offers implicit wait. So what it does is it keeps pulling the DOM. When the DOM is ready, you go ahead. That is implicit. If you want to wait for one specific event, you use an explicit wait. You say you don't continue, or rather you wait until this happens. If that doesn't happen, then you mark it as fail. If that until that happens, you don't do anything. Uh, and how do you configure some, something as uh, waiting for something to happen. How do you uh, take it off? And uh, okay, so towards the end of this presentation, I'll give you an example of an explicit wait. Okay, so picking nose is not this. Uh, how many of us here have uh, used nose tests? Right. Uh, for those of us who have no idea what nose tests is, one of the first things my my boss asked me while writing. I was spending a lot of time in writing uh, test cases. Huh? So he comes one day and he asks me, hey, Saj, how many test cases do we have? Eh? And uh, I clumsily started uh, opening up my terminal. And I opened this. And I started counting it one by one. <laughs> yeah, it might be obvious to you guys, but not to me. Eh? So. Then I learned about something called nose tests. And with that, I could do a simple collect command. And voila, I have 26 tests here. And this was like, holy crap, this is a smart way of working. And what else could I do with nose tests? So if I go back to this screen here, you can see, um, I'm not sure if it's big enough, but uh, this says Migbo post. So the application I was working for earlier is something like Twitter. So we had uh, test cases grouped under posting, post reactions, and so on. So this class is for all tests under post. So with nose tests, I'm able to run only post tests. And um, I'm able to organize my tests in a better way, apart from uh, debugging easily. Right. So there are very many options. And nose tests is also a plugin based, it uh, follows a plugin based architecture. So if there's something that you need, there's a good chance that someone has written a plugin that you can use with nose tests. And uh, you can work with that. So it's, it's very flexible. And uh, here is, is uh, some of the things which I use that for organizing tests better. So I can divide my tests into classes and I can run them selectively. I can run selective tests. It 
allows me to have attributes for each and every test. Uh, it supports a plugin architecture. It lists all tests like I showed you. And uh, it's a lot less boilerplate code. And more information, check out those tests. From that, you are all there. Is it, is it such a huge win over unit tests? Say what again? Is it such a huge win over unit tests? Unit tests to answer that question, I should have done unit testing. I don't know. You guys have to tell me whether this is better or not. No, no stays is test runner. It's not a replacement for unit test. You still, use, you still can use unit test, but you use NOS to run the test. It knows you don't have to use unit test as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, correct. I think it's better than unit test because of the test discovery. It's, uh, you have a better Two way to structure seven. your tests into folders and subfolders, and they will still be, still be discovered by this test runner, and they wouldn't be discovered with unit tests so easily. As long as it starts with test, then it gets discovered as a test. OK, so that's the other lesson that I learned, those tests. And this, I think, is the last lesson before we wind up. Um, so we had about 30 test cases before we could say the product is sane or not before production uh, release. And uh, typically on Firefox or Chrome, it took me 12 minutes. Again, I can spend this time doing something more, uh, something that I really want to. And uh, the alternative is, I spoke about this earlier, use headless. So PhantomJS installation is pretty easy. It's straightforward. Selenium works uh, with PhantomJS quite easily. And the same tests on PhantomJS is about seven minutes. That is almost half the time. And uh, I can spend that time doing things I like doing. So the last lesson learned here would be try using headless. It's a step toward continuous integration or deployment. And uh, the performance is better. It does not need UI or GUI. So you can set it up on EC2 or your own computer using Vagrant or anything else. So that brings us to the last part of this presentation. This is Holmium. This was developed by this guy who was my mentor, um, my Python mentor, and uh, that's his URL. This is a plugin for NOS tests. You remember I told you about Adam Goucher and his fantastic ways of writing page objects. So for, again, for me, that was complex because I had no idea what an object was, let alone, let alone what a page object is and what it should do. So this guy, what he did was he took that concept, he, he made an abstract of it, and he open sourced it. And uh, the best way for me now to write page objects is using Holmium. Apart from that, I'm also able to do other things, like I can specify the environment, specify the browser, and uh, run tests remotely. So if I give you an example of what a Holmium script looks like, you can see that I'm importing um, page object, page element, and locators from Holmium core. This is the way I would define elements using uh, Holmium. So I have my element name, and uh, I have the element, and I have the locator name, and I have a timeout. I can also do things like in, uh, specifying a parent element and things like that. And this was, again, the standard method in my login page object. Now, how do I run the same test? I start with NOS tests, path to my actual test. And I say with Holmium. And uh, I specify the browser. I specify the environment and also the user agent if I want to. I don't have to. And uh, these are some of the options that uh, came along with Holmium Core. The same guy, Ali, he's also written a plugin to, to dump data into a MySQ, your results into a MySQL database. I would recommend you to check it out if you want to have a nice test runner displaying all your results on your wall in your company, saying what passed and what failed and what's the history of things like that. Check it out. So which brings us to the end of this presentation. And I have one last question for you. Anyone? Anyone? Zero. Zero? Ouch. OK. Yeah. It's broken anyway. OK, you're taking the blame. Fine. It is uh, zero. Yeah, we just report the problem. We don't care whether you fix it or not. Huh? <laughs> so you can view this presentation here. And uh, do you have any questions for me? Nothing at all. I didn't quite understand what Holmium does, because the code looked pretty much identical to the one that you showed earlier, where you already introduced us to, this, to the idea of page <laughs> objects. That you had these four lines just defining these objects. Yeah. One of the things with Holmium, the advantage is if you use standard page objects and standard uh, Selenium code to write tests, 
let's say you have five tests. Your browser opens and closes for each of these tests. You have to have a teardown method and uh, it happens. So you're wasting a lot of time. What Holmium does this, it puts the web driver initiation into these things. So I can have 50 test cases. I don't have to have my browser launching and um, closing every time between tests. So that saves me a lot of time. That is one of the advantages. Also, it is very easy for me to use it. Um, again, when I started with page objects, what Adam Gaucher said made sense. However, I could not work with it right away. This, I could work with it. And uh, yeah. any other questions? Can you put up the URL again? <laughs> <laughs> So that's from bit.ly, j.mp, Python for black box testers. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't know nothing about Selenium. I never tried before. Are you a working with uh, Flash also? I'm not sure whether it would work with Flash. I would think no, but uh, I have to test it out. But uh, give it a shot. If you're a Mac user, just say, I mean, install Selenium and you can get going with four lines of code. Anything else? Do you think Selenium can be used to test something like Gmail, for example, in some context of Gmail? Yes. I had a sample script where I could uh, start my iPhone uh, simulator and uh, I could uh, install Selenium remote web driver there. And I have the same script that I used to desktop, uh, for desktop Gmail and I could uh, test it. Again, you have to be very careful with your weights because things get bloody fast. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, in some, bro uh, some uh, applications, the, the fields are protected by some uh, crypto libraries. Like, like you log in a bank login. Can you do that test on this? Uh, so I had my configuration pulled away from my tests. Um, let's say if something has to be encrypted, I've not tried that, but my passwords, my usernames were all in open. So if you open config.py, you will be able to see that. I think QTP offered this option of encrypting your password so it's not visible. I think, I, I don't know whether there's an option for that in Python. If you do, let me know. Yeah, uh, is Phantom JS like, like it's a headless browser, it does not require any GUI, so you can run it on a server environment. Correct. You don't need to install virtual displays and all that. Correct. You don't need to. You don't need to. You still need to install something like X, X, you don't need to. For no, you don't need to. Yeah. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Unless they are very badly designed, I won't be able to. So that is one of the problems with automated testing. It is not fully automated. You still have to have human intervention for whether saying if it's a captcha or if the photo is beautiful or not. A computer, I don't know whether that could do that yet. So this needs some human involvement. Uh, can Selenium test the position of the elements? Yes. You can assert positions. Uh, so, I mean, uh, is there a way, so if, if I'm waiting for something to happen, is there a way that I can continue with the other tests in something like Yes, uh, with nose, I, th I think I would probably put it put an if statement saying if this doesn't happen, continue with life. So with nose, what happens is if one test fails, the whole script does not abruptly come to an end. It goes on to the other test. Yeah. But if I want to continue with my test, it's an if statement. If this fails, go on with other stuff. So it's not about failure. It's like I'm waiting for a telephone call. So again, you don't want to be waiting indefinitely. So you want to wait until you think it is reasonable uh, time. For instance, if I have a login page, I would not expect a simple login to take me more than five seconds. Five seconds itself is a lot of time. I would still put a timeout of 10 seconds. If something does not happen within 10 seconds, then there's something wrong with the application itself rather than my tests. But I think it means parallel execution of yeah. 100 tests that you execute 10 at the same time as multiple threading as possible. This one? Yeah, done it. Okay. A, uh, I want to show you this yeah. explicit weights. Huh? Okay. You can see here that I've used an explicit weight. This was heavily um, using JavaScript. And um, the DOM was ready. And uh, my test kept failing. So I had to say, until the UI lock 
is not displayed, you wait. So the, the UI offered me a, a spinning spinner, and until that was displayed on the screen, I'm not going to do anything. I start continue with my test only when this is not displayed anymore. This is an example of an explicit wait. So that will return a true or false according to the Correct. So I'm checking whether uh, until it's false. Any other questions? So after this presentation, how many of us are going to go back to our companies and being nice with our black box testers? Remember, we are having a tough time. We don't have uh, that much programming experience, so be nice to us. Thank you very much, and uh, let me know if you have any questions.